Well, welcome to SolarWorks for Illinois. I'm Tim Montague, your host. This is the monthly show from Continental Electrical about the solar industry, the renewables industry, and everything related to that, including net zero. Today, it's my great pleasure to have the New Building Institute on the show, and they're going to present some of their latest information from the commercial net zero um, industry. As many of our viewers and attendees know, net zero is all about making buildings super energy efficient, right? You want to get those megawatts first, and then you're creating local renewable energy on site to produce all of the power for those super energy efficient buildings. And I'll just mention that one of the largest net zero projects in the country is in Colorado. That's the NREL facility, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. That's a, uh, I believe a 360,000 square foot facility. So if you're ever in the Boulder, Denver area, please check out NREL. They have a beautiful campus there. Um, but so today we're joined uh, by Kathy Higgins, who is the research director, and Alexi Miller, who's a senior project manager for the New Building Institute. Kathy has over 25 years in energy efficiency and strategic planning, research, policy, and large-scale project management. At NBI, she manages work involving net zero energy buildings, of course, um, measuring performance, emerging technologies, market assessment, and supports business development. Kathy is currently leading a $5 million field demonstration in, uh, in Los Angeles to the, uh, the retrofit potential and energy savings for shading and lighting technologies. So welcome to SolarWorks for Illinois, Alexi and Kathy, and then Kathy's gonna take it away and she will introduce Alexi partway through. Welcome. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here. And I don't know if that green box is supposed to be on me, but you know, let me know if it's different. Um, we are here for New Buildings Institute and appreciate SolarWorks for Illinois hosting this um, very contemporary topic. I'm going to get going on that by letting you know who MBI is. New Buildings Institute, we're a national nonprofit and we've been in place for 20 years and we work in, in driving best practices in commercial buildings energy efficiency through three main mechanisms, policy initiatives, um, guidelines and best practices to the design community, architects and engineers, and, in, and through research, emerging technology research. And we have program areas that overlap with all of those. So you're hearing from a nonprofit and we're here to contribute our knowledge to your knowledge. Today, we're going to divide um, the presentation into about two thirds and one third. The first section I'll be leading on zero energy and there's four sections, as you can see on the screen. And then my colleague, Alexi Miller, senior project manager with our organization, will give you a deeper dive on a topic that we're initiating called Grid Optimal. And he'll explain what that is, and you'll hear about our work and about zero energy. So as topic number one on definitions and data, thank you, Tim, for saying the very important thing that a uh, zero energy building is first and foremost a, a low energy building. So there's a lot of names out there and confusion is super easy to get. There's um, net zero, zero net, there's nearly zero, zero ready. Let's talk about what ones we're using today and what a definition is. So a zero energy building is first and foremost a very energy efficient building and then it meets 100% of its annual energy from renewables. Um, the terms that MBI uses is that we confirm the energy use of a building through verified energy data. That means the building has performed and proved that it's performed at a year or more of energy um, use that was lower than its production of renewables on site. Emerging is a larger set because those buildings are striving to get to that place, but they may not have had a year of data, or they may also be um, not hit their target through changes in weather or changes in occupancy or um, just not provided data. So verified and emerging are the two sets of uh, zero energy buildings. Very important to watch emerging buildings. They tell us a lot about the trends in our industry. And then we also have zero energy ready that's used in the industry to indicate a building that is equal in energy use to a zero energy building, but it may or may not have renewables on it. So that's an energy uh, comparable building. And lastly, in terms of definitions, when we talk about the energy relationship of the buildings to targets, we're looking at all fuels. It's always all fuels, whether it's gas, steam, uh, electric, they're all um, then levelized into British thermal units per square foot per year. And we're looking to try and see that the buildings net its energy use after renewables is equal or greater than its use. 
and that's expressed in this last term that you'll see in some of my energy performance slides, which is energy use intensity. And I understand a lot of you probably know these terms. So EUI is the energy use intensity of all fuels. So let's look first at, at what's really going on kind of worldwide from a big step, let's step back in the big picture. And Johnson Controls does an incredible survey every year um, worldwide asking about energy efficiency and green building movements. And here you can see that on the left, that the drivers for energy efficient investments are, are diverse, and yet many of them are items that you have in your local areas, like new policies or cost savings, depending upon whether you're working as a contractor or you're working as a utility rep or you're working in a government entity, you can give those messages and know what reaction that some of the market is, is thinking. And on, the, and on the right, that just shows you the, the countries that participate. So this slide, I think, is, was the most interesting. I just pulled a couple of graphics from Johnson's report. Um, the plans to invest in electric energy storage and on-site renewables, I know, is of interest to many of you. And you can see that 57% of the respondents, and there were thousands of participants, plan to do some on-site renewables in the next 12 months. And the growth in storage, of course, is really uh, increasing. And in the net zero slide to the right, the picture over here, you see, you see that more respondents expect to have a net zero or near net zero building, that that's getting up into the 50% or greater worldwide. So this is not a fringe trend. This is a mainstream um, market-driven and policy-driven activity. So let me tell you of some data, which is the section we're in on zero energy buildings. What you see here is that since we've been tracking this, which started about 2010, so about nine years ago, we did our first report in 2012, and we've had seen 700% growth in zero energy buildings that are either verified through data or emerging. We now have over 550 buildings in our MBI getting to zero um, list, which is available publicly on, on our website. So you can see the names of these buildings, you can see their locations. It's really important when you're trying to motivate other people to be able to cite buildings that are a like type building. Let's, let's look up all the offices in the Midwest, for example, that Tim might want to show that are already net zero. So he could screen and filter for offices, middle of the country and zero net energy. So by type of that data set of 550 to 600 buildings, when you count ultra low, you see that education is by far the largest sector. 37% of the buildings are in education. And you see the breakdown of the types of education here in the bottom part of the graph. Um, that, uh, that makes a ton of sense because public sector buildings began before the private sector. But you also see offices. And the one that's surprising us a little bit is that multifamilies really increased. And that's a sector we thought would be difficult to get to zero because of the diverse energy use of, of residential occupants in what's a, essentially a commercial building if it's more than four units. But they're going net zero. All these uh, variety of buildings are going net zero. Up to 60 different building types we have in our data set. And a, a trend that I personally think is really a telling market transformative change is that we now have almost half public and half private. 10 years ago, I could have just shown you only public buildings, a few demonstration sites on universities, and um, the, a few small schools. But now I can show you a lot of private sector for profit. About 25% of the private sector is for profit. And when they start getting involved in going zero, you know there's a market rationale behind that. And across the country, again, about 10 years ago, I could only show you mild climates, a few buildings that were um, in very easy to accomplish uh, climate zones. But here we have 42 states, every climate zone, cold climate zones, humid climate zones, and every state um, except for eight states aren't yet uh, that we know of have zero energy buildings. So that's always my chance to call out to you. If you know of a building, in whether it's already on the map in these states or not, we want to count the buildings because we use these to make market change and to make policy arguments um, regarding the potential for moving forward with these practices. And what does it mean in terms of that energy use intensity? How low can a building go? And one metric that we compare it to is, of course, code standards. Codes have progressed enormously in the last 20 years, but the um, the uh, argument often is that it's very hard to go past code. Well, you can see from these buildings that that's not necessarily true. 
the orange bar here is the National uh, Study on Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey by the Department of Energy and Energy um, Industry. And that's a standard existing building. Next is ASHRAE. And you see these zero energy buildings are significantly low. They have EUIs, that energy use intensity, usually in the 20s, 18 to 28 here. And then if they're net positive, then they're, they're, they're below that. So the energy performance is half the best codes in, in the country, which is state of California. Um, that's about 50% reduction from some of the best codes. So the trends that you're interested in and that are going on with buildings is we're seeing a lot more larger projects. We have 44% of the projects and 88% of the floor space on buildings 50,000 square feet or larger. So big buildings can get there. We see the private sector growth I just spoke to and diversity of types. And people often, you know, always ask, how do they do it? How do they get to low energy sufficient that the solar on site can meet all their needs? And here's a list of technologies. But the real takeaway from these technologies is that they're not um, way out on the edge. They're off the shelf technologies. They're available today on the market. And when when designed in by a competent team, a team with some experience in doing trade-offs of, of um, HVAC reduction to glazing, they're often very cost effective and the cost can come in at, at uh, near equal to or equal to the standard design. So that brings me to the case study topics. Give you a few examples of buildings that have done this. I think um, the Bullet Building, certainly one of the leading buildings, I think it won the International Green Building of the Year when it was built in about uh, 2012, I believe. But you see on the left here, this is an important concept, especially for those of you on because of your interest in solar, that all um, design firms that work with these buildings start with a solar budget. How much solar is available on the site to that building roof area? And um, what's fun about this diagram given to us by PAE here in Portland is that if it were built to standard construction, look at the roof area here that would be needed for the solar to meet a standard building in Seattle's energy use. Well, that's certainly not going to happen. But here, if they built a high performance building, which would be it's kind of standard low energy, a little beyond code, this would be the PV area. But they brought it down to an EUI of 16, incredibly impressive amount of energy reduction here and got 14,000 square feet of PV. In the case of Bullet, as you can see, they got a variance in the city, which the city gladly gave in terms of their extension of their roof area um, because they're such a, um, um, a catalyst building for, for meeting some of the city goals on carbon reduction and, and uh, climate change goals by having buildings that can be uh, net zero and create their own energy use. And over here on the graphic, you see that's an 83% savings over the an average building in Seattle and still quite a bit below the code, which would be a 52. So that's a case study on, on Bullet Foundation. Here's one on a speculative office building, which I think is really compelling because the private sector has to make the business case of why they would invest in these uh, more extensive technologies and perhaps more um, energy um, intensive more energy savings uh, approaches. And that's here in California. This was uh, Kevin Bates of Sharp Development. You see that he found here in his quote that it was more profitable for him to retrofit this, this previous um, class B kind of strip mall office building into a zero net energy building, even though it cost him almost $50 a square foot more to do that retrofit, he ended up with $4 a square foot um, net profit from the day he opened the building. And you can see that he has a net positive over here, the total energy use, 13.5, less his renewable production, is a net of a negative, which means he's producing 15 kBTUs per square foot more than he uses. And these slides, as Tim said, are available, so you can look in more detail at these in the future. The Redding School of Arts, because schools are such a leading uh, practitioner of net zero, and, and every school in this country should be able to meet a net zero um, outcome because they're a perfect prototype for net zero with their large roof areas, usually one to two stories tall. Um, and they're just fantastic building because they also shared with the community and the students about uh, a building that can teach. 
So in Reading, they used uh, daylighting, efficient HVAC, um, some educational dashboards, and they produced a building that's 77,000 square feet that is, has a very low energy and is almost meeting its renewable production. So you can see over here that they're a little bit short of meeting their, their renewables, but that can be a variety of things. A low energy building is fantastic. Here also North Face and VF Outdoor Campus. I liked this uh, example to show you because it's a campus example, multiple buildings. You see the solar distributed up in the left-hand corner across the site rather than solely on the rooftop. That's a great way to um, do a district or a, a, a multiple building portfolio. And they've met their campus's needs through all the, the, um, the um, installation of photovoltaics and they are uh, a net zero campus. Next um, example is go zero energy and save a million dollars. This is a true case study from an integral group out of California for the Kaiser Permanente building. Um, it's a fantastic uh, office building that they designed and what's compelling about this is that they would usually do a VAV reheat system, which is a somewhat more complicated. It's got a lot of um, more ductwork. It's got different uh, systems that would invest, would, would require them to have an investment of a greater amount of money than what they chose, which was uh, an all electric option. This is an all electric building, another trend in, in energy use for carbon reduction, electric buildings. And by doing this, they went to a simpler system. They used thermally zoned heat pumps. And because of that, they were able to do a trade-off. I know this is a bit small, but they did this, the trade-off to go all electric, to go to the different HVAC system, and they resulted in a million dollars net savings over the budget that, that Kaiser gave them for a building that would have been a standard practice building, not a net zero building. They brought net zero to Kaiser at a million dollars under the budget. Lastly, this is super interesting. It's, it's a vertical place uh, PVs used as facade. This is my, my colleague and friend, Andy Bush, is uh, Morgan Creek Ventures in Boulder, Colorado. It's called Boulder Commons. And he created a tax structure whereby Solars actually uh, um, creates a return on investment for his, his, um, his business than his development of commercial properties. And he has a number of buildings he'll be um, creating in the, in the Boulder area. But he traded off costs that would have been his facade cost for vertical, and he got about 86% of the same amount of solar as the rooftop would have, but he traded off some of his facade costs. So the efficacy of the vertical place PV is extremely good, more than anyone expected, in terms of both production and cost effectiveness. Very interesting. And then because of the way that he looked at the market and the way that he set up the solar to give the tenants the uh, their utility costs at a comparable rate, he's got a cash return as a developer of 8.3%. Excellent uh, economic model. Third topic is policies and trends that uh, I know that is an important driver. Just a few points on this, that energy efficiency storage and grid and renewables are kind of becoming um, an integrated approach to accomplish zero energy and to be a policy um, strategy. There's codes progressing in the direction if you want a 2030 goal, which is a, a typical 2030 and 2050 are standard goals for, for cities and governments for meeting climate action targets and that we've got a progression of codes going more and more aggressively so that renewables can meet 100% of the load of a code building in the future. California's leading that practice, and you can see that their targets step down. This very next year, by, by code, every building in California that's a resident, single family residence has to be net zero ready um, and uh, be able to meet its electric use on site through renewables and the commercial is following that in 2030. Very, very amazing that this is now a policy in our country. Other places that are doing the same, they use mechanisms like net energy metering, um, they have climate and action, climate and uh, energy plans, they're in initiating financial and tax incentives. And over on the right, this is a ZEPI jurisdictional score 
And this is where the state's policies, MBI's created a, a scoring mechanism to score various state policies as to how friendly and um, able to advance their, the objectives of zero energy and, and on the path to a zero carbon outcome different states have. And that's ranked and that way states can be motivated to improve their score through policy adoption. Here's some examples of states that are already have policies in place or are developing policies, a number of states. So this is quite a bit of growth in the last four or five years. And cities and counties are doing the same. I think some of you may have heard, you know, there's a lot of reduction in some of our federal leadership on these topics, but that's why it's important to look at the positive that's going on at the cities, counties, and state level. And uh, MBI tracks these as well as the buildings so that uh, people like yourselves in this industry can make the case about uh, that they're not the first out of the gate. There's others doing this and you can take some of these uh, policies and approaches that other jurisdictions have done and use them as models in your area. Lastly, I just wanna point out a few resources that are available to you before I turn it over to my colleague. And that's some resources as a nonprofit. We're funded by foundations and, and uh, some utility program partners. And we develop an enormous amount of resources on these topics that are available to you. That's a small, small snippet of the, the amount of things, but these are all available on our website. Um, if this is a topic, uh, no matter which industry you're in or whether it's technologies or design practices or making the case, we have some, some uh, tools and resources that can help you. And there's a number of uh, non-MBI resources as well. That would be ex extremely extensive, but I did want to call attention to PG&E's case studies up in the upper right corner, also publicly available in PDF. Our database that I've been referencing all along where I get this information, that's a registry. So you want to register your building there and you can also access the sum of the buildings and see um, some information about where they are and some of the data I showed you, as well as a number of books by colleagues and uh, fellows that are part of MBI are shown here on the bottom. We do uh, workshops and trainings. Um, people bring us into a variety of places around the nation where we can help facilitate design charrettes, workshops, schools, um, different practitioners need help aggregating their, their groups into the thoughts and uh, outcomes they're trying to accomplish. Lastly, um, our national forum is coming up in Oakland and it's open for speakers right now. Maybe some of you have a great topic, would love to hear from you and have you submit a topic to speak at our forum. It's the largest uh, top uh, commercial building uh, zero net energy forum in the country. And we hope you'll join us there. So we're gonna pause for a moment here. If Tim has any questions, I think we didn't note, they could be at the end as well, that there's a chat section in your, um, on your screen that you're able to put in questions. And then Tim can look at those over the course of the presentation and bring them forward either now or at the end. What would you like, Tim? Yes, Kathy, we have a question from Sarah. Are the net zero definitions based on site or source energy calculations? Great question, Sarah, absolutely relevant. Um, they are, the definitions I'm using are based on site, um, although the definitions of a verified building and a, an emerging building, those are irregardless of whether you're measuring the energy use in site or source. For those that don't know the difference, the site is the energy at the building and the source is the energy at the building plus the energy uh, used to generate and, and um, deliver the energy. So it's usually a multiplier of about three times the site energy would, would incorporate the generation side. Yeah, and just to build on that, this is Alexi, hello. Uh, we will uh, verify a building based on either site or source. We typically, in the graphics you saw, those are generally site, um, but in our zero energy buildings list uh, that we released last year and in our database and other resources, um, we often show both of those side by side. Right, yeah. So we, so in we, other words, the the holy grail of net zero is source energy, right? That's a super good point, Tim, because um, you do want, the reason we're doing anyone's interested in, in, uh, in zero energy is to reduce fossil fuel use primarily. 
of course, to reduce costs if you're the owner, but we're doing it environmentally to reduce the generation side and thus source measures that more comprehensively. Correct. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I've actually been uh, making the case in a couple of venues in uh, presentations related to energy codes that we may be, we may want to think about uh, metrics other than just energy at this point, um, that it may be time to shift for from an energy focus, which is really about depletable resources, uh, you know, running out of fossil fuels, for example, uh, running out of oil in the ground into uh, more of an emissions focus, uh, which which gets at the societal problems that all these policies that Kathy mentioned are trying to address, which is which is really largely emissions driven. So there's there are a few different things going on here, um, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, where you ask, et cetera, or who you ask, et cetera. Um, there are multiple drivers that are pushing this broad trend toward so hybrid. What you're referring to is uh, zero carbon, and, and Brandon makes this comment. I think the holy grail is zero carbon. We're going to run out of atmosphere before we run out of fossil fuels. Um, so, yes, that in the background here, of course, is how do we uh, run a modern society without borrowing from future generations? That's kind of the bottom line here. Today, we are living way beyond our means, and that is going to impact our children and our children's children in very negative ways. So we're, we're trying to figure that out, and that's, what Net Zero, that's why Net Zero is a phenomenon and, and part of the solution. Yeah, I appreciate that you're mentioning these things um, and their decarbonization and electrification are trends that are surpassing zero energy right now, where zero energy is in and of itself getting a reduction of whatever generating source delivered to the building. But the electrification and all electric building, which removes fossil fuels at the building, is a great next step. And I showed you a couple examples of those but it's not necessarily a zero carbon building because it could be the electricity delivered to it is most likely to, uh, generated by coal or by natural gas. So we have to go upstream and some of what Alexi is gonna talk about addresses that. Great, why don't we move on? Okay. Very good, Kathy. I'm going to request control from you here. And off you go. You've got it. Great. So thanks, Kathy, that was, that was fascinating. Um, let's make sure Sometimes you don't know what your colleagues do. That's great. <laughs> yeah, there we go. We're moving ahead. Excellent. Great. So I'm going to discuss uh, the Grid Optimal Buildings Initiative. This is uh, a recent initiative that NBI has launched in collaboration with the U.S. Green Building Council. Uh, I'm the project manager for Grid Optimal, and I'm going to give you an overview on what we're doing thinking about the way buildings and the utility grid, the electricity grid interact. Uh, to, to, and it really builds on what Kathy was saying because moving toward a future uh, dominated by zero energy buildings assumes that the grid is going to continue to, uh, to serve all those buildings as it is today. And we need to be considerate and we need to be careful of how we build uh, all buildings, not just zero energy buildings, to make sure that they're, they're good grid citizens. So I'll talk a little bit about grid citizenship here. Um, the, do I have a lag or is it just not going? There we go. Should be seeing the sponsor screen here. So uh, the Grid Optimal Buildings Initiative is a, an open collaborative multi-stakeholder entity or initiative um, led by NBI and US Green Building Council, as I said, and just wanted to take a moment to recognize the sponsors. Um, we have a, a variety of utility and other sponsors, uh, both public and private utilities from around the country, including uh, Commonwealth Edison, ComEd in the Chicagoland area. So thank you to our sponsors uh, for letting us, uh, for, for enabling us to do this important work. So let me start with a little bit of introduction on what is driving us to think about this. So what you see here is the infamous duck curve. Uh, that's a curve of net load in California. And it's uh, these days often being seen at, at conferences and presentations and people talking about what's going on with utilities as we get more distributed energy resources coming onto the system. We know, broadly speaking, that uh, the role of the utility is changing. The role of buildings in the grid is evolving. And uh, the large amounts of distributed energy resources coming online 
in various parts around the country are, are really driving utilities to consider potentially new business models. What we're doing is uh, seeking solutions to some of these complex and thorny challenges um, and trying to do so in a way that enables a broad market transformation. So we're pulling top experts together to think about some answers to these questions. Uh, as we see more distributed energy resources on the grid, we're finding that there is not necessarily a consistent language or consistent terms uh, that people are using to talk about these issues. Uh, the, especially between sectors or between one side of the, the meter and the other, the building operator, owner, designer may not be speaking the same language as the grid operator or owner. And uh, this is resulting in some challenges when we're talking about harmonization of buildings and the grid. Um, we're seeing some, some, some pretty interesting side effects come up that I'll talk a little bit about. Um, there's been an evolution in the way utility grids work. Uh, it used to be that you flipped a switch, the power's always on. We're still in that situation. Uh, good job utilities for that. Uh, but we're moving from a paradigm in which we have centralized generation, big plants, the grid power flows one way from the grid to the building, and, uh, and it always runs in that uh, configuration. Now that we're seeing a lot more renewable energy come online, things are starting to change because some of that energy is, is much more distributed. Uh, the chart on the left here, the cost of new energy buildouts, uh, this actually is, is remarkable and there are several different sources that show this, this same result. Uh, the cost of large scale wind and solar is often the very cheapest resource that can be procured in the world. Um, and there was a recent uh, solar deployment that came in, uh, what was it, two and a half dollars per megawatt hour, so even substantially below that. Um, this dramatic cost decline, it's been uh, an exponential cost decline for solar, uh, similarly for wind, and we're, I think we're actually starting to see the same thing in energy storage, we're at the, the beginning of that exponential decline, is, is shifting the ground under the utility business model. Another thing that's happening is that as these resources become much more affordable, uh, rooftop solar, for example, has become within reach of uh, for, for many buildings all around the country. That requires an interactive grid to be able to manage the energy flowing in where previously it only flowed out. Uh, that bottom bullet there, oversupply and curtailment, are a growing challenge. In some places, we are now seeing uh, those renewable resources need to be turned off at certain times of the day or certain times of the year because we basically don't know what to do with the power. It's hard to integrate into the grid. So that re represents really wasted effort, wasted resources if we have these renewable resources and we're not able to use them because the grid can't accommodate them. The building has a role to play in addressing that. So what we're doing is uh, we are considering how different building features can be measured in a way that uh, can allow them to enhance grid operation. So what you see on the slide here, uh, you've got a couple different opportunities for building integration with the grid. And this is a, a technology focus. Looking at it right now, it's a kind of an easy way to get your head around it. There are a couple different ways that buildings can interact with the grid or that a building in its design, construction, operation uh, can, can be adjusted to make it more grid friendly. So for example, we're used to thinking about permanent efficiency uh, or energy efficiency as, as, it's, as it's now known today. That basically means reducing building energy loads and that definitely has a part to play in making buildings better grid citizens. Utilities may also want to see peak shifting uh, in which the time during which the building uses the maximum amount of energy, it's, its total KW, can be adjusted, maybe moved throughout the day or reduced. Uh, peak shedding is also uh, often used. There, there are a couple different terms. I won't get too deep into the details of what they all mean. Um, <clears throat> utilities are also, and grid operators are also interested in uh, being able to communicate with building systems and building loads. Uh, demand response programs do that today, but the scope of those programs and what people are thinking about in terms of building grid communication is evolving a lot. Uh, and we're working on, on feeding that conversation. And finally, there's, there's ability for the utility to dispatch energy storage that's coming up as well. So fundamentally, what we're doing here, that's a lot of pieces. There's a whole bunch of stuff that could be done in this space. And it's, it's a large, uh, very dynamic market. What we're doing as part of the Grid Optimal Buildings Initiative is developing metrics 
that uh, allow us to measure how a building is performing as a grid citizen. That intent, the intent there is both to align the needs of the grid with the needs of the building so that there's better communication across both sides of the meter there, uh, and also to support least cost decarbonization of the grid, for example, by making sure that renewable energy resources and distributed energy resources that are uh, scattered throughout distribution grids, transmission grids, and, and the, the various systems that make up the grid uh, are able to be used and that we're, we're, we're really maximizing those resources and maximizing the performance of buildings on the grid. So just to recap, it's, it's about at this stage developing metrics and developing a common language. We'll talk a little bit about how grid optimal uh, targets building loads. Um, what you see here is an idealized building base load. Uh, the axes are not shown, but basically on the, on the x-axis from left to right is time. So here's a day. Uh, it's not using a ton of energy at night. It's using more energy during the, the main part of the day when everyone's in the building and doing things. Less energy overnight again. Uh, Y-axis is, is higher demand, KW, for example. Automated demand response programs are, they exist in uh, various utilities around the country, quite a few. Um, they've been around for 10, 20 plus years in some places. And basically those say, okay, for this particular chunk of time, say 15 minutes or 30 minutes, we're going to call an event. We'd like you to curtail some loads, uh, shed some power so that it's easier to address that peak. That helps. It's, it's got a somewhat limited approach, uh, but it certainly is part of the solution. This green line shows, uh, the result of say a, a broad energy efficiency program or an energy efficiency retrofit, new construction program, et cetera, on a building. You can see the peak is reduced, so is the base load. Um, that may impact the, uh, the, the building load factor as well. So uh, the load factor has to do with the difference between the base, uh, the lowest amount of energy that building uses and its peak. And that can be helpful as well. Now you get renewables coming in um, that are often not perfectly aligned in terms of time with the peak. So in many places, for example, and this is driving the duck curve in California that I alluded to earlier, the sun is shining uh, during the day, but the peak is often actually 6, 7, 8 p.m. And in many places, peaks are moving later into the evening hours. So there are various ways to adjust that, for example, energy storage or using the building as a battery without having a, a battery per se can be a good way to, to get that moving. And that's what we're trying to do here is measure the difference that it makes in a building, for example, to be able to shift its load curve earlier, whether that's by uh, battery storage or other technologies in the building. You can also look at some other things here, uh, some, some overlays, I like to call them, onto, onto that basic load shape driven piece, that kilowatt piece. Um, for example, here is the California grid. This is CAISO, California Inter Independent System Operator. They run the grid in California. And this is the marginal carbon efficiency or carbon intensity of grid delivered electricity in California over a year. This is 2017. Uh, what this shows us is when you have those spring and early summer months where there is uh, there's sunshine, there's hydro, and there's wind, during the day, the grid is less carbon intensive. That's the darkest green. In certain other hours, uh, it, for example, at nighttime, even in those months, and especially uh, in the morning and the evening in uh, fall, winter, and and very early spring, you're seeing uh, the grid become much more carbon intensive because the utilities need to dispatch fossil fuel powered resources uh, and don't have as much of those renewables available. So by thinking about this as, as overlays, we can think about, okay, how good is this particular building, not only at shifting its peak, but also at aligning with whatever goal we're trying to do here. Are we trying to reduce carbon? Well, how does the building align with this carbon heat map here? Are we trying to reduce peak and make grid services better to better, the grid better able to provide service to that building? Well, let's, let's look at that overlay. So there are a couple different angles we're considering here. For example, uh, Kathy mentioned a few uh, case studies, and I think that that's, that's a really good way to look at this. Um, this is a pilot project that we did in California uh, it's an office building in uh, Northern California in the Sonoma region. Uh, and what we did here is we worked with the building designer, the MEP firm, 
to evaluate based on the building they thought they were building or were planning on, right? Came up with a building design. That building design comes with a load shape. So they ran simulation models of the building as is pretty common during building design. And you can see in gray on the right side of the screen, that's the load shape. So not a whole lot of usage overnight. It's an office building. We come and we ramp up in the morning, get a morning peak uh, at, what is that? About eight, 9 a.m. Then kind of comes down throughout the day. Some occupancy continues in the building until maybe 10 p.m. And then it drops off to that low nighttime level again. So this is just one particular day, one example. Um, we looked at this for the entire year, but, uh, but here's an example. Now there are a couple overlays we have done to evaluate what's going on in the building. One, uh, that blue line is the total uh, CAISO or California grid system load. So kilowatts on the, or megawatts really, on the grid in California. That blue line on top is the total, all resources. The gray line down below is the net, so minus renewables. So you can see that there are some, some peaks, uh, and in fact, the renewables come throughout the day. You've got your morning peak, you've got your evening peak. Uh, neither of them is, is eliminated by those renewables. So for this building, it might be helpful to try to concentrate some of the usage when you have uh, that net load, and maybe even at night as well. The other overlay we're looking at, or, or the second, because there is one more, the second is this orange line on top. That's the marginal emissions rate. Now, in this case, it was actually pretty well aligned with the uh, California load, and the peak and net load, <clears throat> sorry, the, the total and net load. But that marginal emissions rate is higher at night uh, when the sun is not shining as much. It drops down during the day. It goes back up in the, the early afternoon, about 4 p.m., and stays pretty high uh, in the evening. That's not atypical, but those can be very variable uh, by day, by season, by week, uh, all sorts of different, uh, different time, time increments there. But it works out actually in this case that the, those align well. So we've got these two pink shaded regions, the morning peak time, well, basically when that building is starting up uh, before most occupants arrive, and the evening hours uh, when the occupants are, are mostly not there, but the building is still chugging along full steam, if you will. Those are times when the grid is seeing peak, it's relatively high carbon, and, uh, and there's something the building could do. So we worked with the MEP firm, the building designers, to find opportunities to adjust the building design um, to, to make changes uh, to that load shape, that gray load shape. And uh, we're actually still in this process right now. So we've, we've recommended, uh, we've been collaboratively working with them to evaluate what the opportunities are to maybe shed some load during those times or, or move load around at night, pre-cool, pre-heat. There's a wide variety of, of uh, elements that can be considered here. And you can see a few of those in the bullet points there. Uh, it's not just slap a battery on it, certainly can help, but you can use your building as a battery through efficiency measures, whether those are permanent efficiency, like design measures, hyper insulation, mm -hmm. for example, or whether those are uh, active components, controls, uh, energy storage, thermal or battery, various other components. <clears throat> One other overlay or one other consideration that we're, we're taking into account here is grid resiliency. Um, a lot of the features that allow a building to be a better grid citizen and help the grid provide services in normal conditions or can allow it to, to lower its carbon footprint, uh, looking at it in this, this more nuanced way, are also really well aligned with grid resiliency. So, uh, this is a picture from Puerto Rico, um, where the Hurricane Maria last year knocked out uh, a large portion of the power grid, and I think all of it for a while. Uh, but it, buildings that have on-site generation and that are designed in such a way that they are grid-friendly and normal operation can also be designed in a way, in many cases, uh, without a huge lift, it could be better resilient, uh, more resilient citizens of the grid. So. Uh, you may have buildings with independent power sources, storage, more passive features so that the, the, they can slide longer when the power's out and stay comfortable, stay, stay reasonable to be in um, for a longer time without power. And also that they can stage up so that not every single load hits right at once when the power comes back on, which can make it really difficult for the utility to restore power. 
this is designed to be a critical bridge between buildings and the grid. So as I mentioned, it's a joint initiative with NBI and US Green Building Council. Um, we're working to integrate elements of LEED uh, or to integrate this into LEED and uh, to integrate uh, grid optimal, the, the metrics, the framework, and some of the considerations here into both LEED and PEER. Uh, which is something like lead for uh, campuses and microgrids and power systems at that scale. We have I've been talking about this for more than a year. Grid Optimal has been formally running for uh, over six months now. And we've really found uh, substantial interest in this and buy-in in this, this concept and, and these ideas from a few different sectors, from regulators uh, and policymakers, from utilities and from buildings. And they have, they each have their own interests and we've found overlap in their interests in a couple different areas. For instance, buildings and regulators often have goals that overlap in getting to zero energy buildings as we're talking about today. Um, the conclusion we've come to here is that in order to scale zero energy buildings, it's important to consider how they're gonna interact with the grid to make sure the grid can keep doing what it needs to do. And that there are uh, overlapping interests in not only resiliency, decarbonization, zero energy buildings, renewable portfolio standards, that's RPS between buildings, uh, between utilities and regulators, um, traditional demand response programs evolving. Um, there are others as well that are not listed here, but, but uh, our intent here is that by creating this common language, we can move toward a future in which there are many more zero energy buildings and they can achieve a lot of these needs that all three of these sectors have. So just to, just to give a quick uh, sum up, there's a lot going on in this space. Uh, what we're doing is trying to create a common language and define metrics that can be used to quantitatively define buildings as grid citizens. And this is gonna be a, a key way to enable the zero energy and other hyper-efficient buildings of the future to basically play nice with the grid, to interact well with the power grid in which they sit and to enable uh, decarbonization of the grid, of buildings and of society in general by better integrating the resources that are on buildings and on the grid. Thanks. Uh, we've got a little time to take questions specific to Grid Optimal, and uh, and after that, perhaps we can also have a little. Uh, if there are other questions that that came up about Kathy's, we can we can both discuss those as well. Tim, thank you, Alexi. So we uh, please do type your questions into the chat box. We get more questions, and um, Sarah did ask. And uh, this is, I think, for both uh, Alexi and Kathy. Uh, in this, ex in your experience, is this type of utility grid load profile data publicly available? Um, I did a quick Google, Google, and found the California the Energy uh, Energy.ca.gov website, uh, where it looks like they make some data available. I'm not familiar here in the Midwest if PJM or MISO makes their data available. I would imagine, but uh, could you address that? Sure, yeah, that is always a challenge. Uh, California ISO has great data, a really good portal. Um, you can see it live. You can see the duck curve live actually, which is, which is fascinating, I think. Maybe I'm just wonky, but I think it's really interesting. Uh, the, there are various other ISO level entities, MISO, PJM, uh, New England ISO, and so on. Um, that have varying degrees of data availability. Um, it's often there, but it can be hard to find. Uh, there's also one thing I'll note relative to or relevant to that, you know, the, the transmission level load shape, which is the, that's the ISO data. That's what you're going to get out of that ISO data. That transmission level load shape is not necessarily the whole picture um, because those ISOs, don't really care too much about the solar panels that are on any one building. They're thinking about things once they aggregate up to the megawatts, hundreds of megawatts, et cetera, scale, because they're dispatching large resources uh, to, to balance the system overall. Now the distribution utility, uh, which is often a, a utility more like your ComEd or your, or, uh, you know, the one you pay your bill to, um, <clears throat> Those utilities may have somewhat different considerations uh, than the, the duck curve or the, the ISO level data. And those may be more granular. They're gonna vary from one substation to another. 
uh, and they may be really more driven by what is going on at the specific building, whether that's on-site generation or dispatchable loads, energy storage, smart vehicle charging. Those are all things that the considerations that that are going to come into play more at the building level for the distribution utility. So, to answer the the question overall, yes, that data can be found um, for most of the ISOs in the country, but but then there are there's this whole other angle about distribution. What we're doing about that in a very quick nutshell is flexibility. So finding ways to quantitatively measure and, and rate or, or, or evaluate a building's flexibility and ability to interact with the grid on, you know, with communications infrastructure. And that can support that distribution grid. And then we have a question from Supriya. How is the grid optimal score calculated? And do you see a future in which codes and standards are also incorporating some kind of score for grid interactive buildings? Well, that first question, for more on that, uh, join our webinar on Thursday. We have a whole hour dedicated to grid optimal. Thursday this week. Uh, actually, I think, Kathy, if you go up one, back up one slide, uh, we'll see the, the, there it is. Yeah. Um, We'll get more into how it's calculated. We are in phase one right now. Uh, so there's still uh, work being done to define the metric. Um, the framework includes uh, evaluation of load shapes, overlays within those load shapes, and flexibility as well as dispatchability of the building. So there are a few different elements going on in that metric. Um, and the answer to that is, is long. What was the other half to that? Half of that, I'm sorry? Do you see a future in which codes and standards also oh, yeah. incorporate some kind of score? Yeah, you know, when we started this, uh, this ball rolling, we expected to first get all the metrics ironed out and work with utilities to integrate this into programs and then maybe get into codes and standards in year two or three. We have gotten significant interest in, in uh, figuring this out from a codes and standards perspective from a couple of different policymakers, California Energy Commission, in uh, NYSERDA in New York, uh, a few other as a few others as well. So yes, uh, this is already you being used to uh, do some some forward thinking in about codes in uh, in a couple of key jurisdictions. Um, <clears throat> I think it's going to be a while before you see grid interaction metrics in every code around the country, but it is things are certainly moving that way. And then we have a question from Brandon. Aside from better time of use electricity pricing, what would incentivize building designers to care? Well, so our thinking here is that once you put a number on this, a lot of different doors open. So a utility incentive program could use the grid optimal metric and, and, and rating system, although it's, that's not really the word to use, but could use the, the metrics within grid optimal to be part of an incentive program so that they could incent building owners, not just on annual kilowatt hours, but also on their grid interactivity. Uh, that's one way, for example, you know, utility incentive program. But if you put a number on it, you can do a lot of things. So uh, grid interactivity also suggests uh, reduced risk in financially speaking, because it redu suggests reduced exposure to demand charges. So that's a bottom line issue for a building owner. Um, and a lot of places, a demand charge can eat up half of a building's utility bill uh, in certain months of the year. So that's a that's a fundamental bottom line question for a building owner or operator: is what's my utility bill going to be? And this is one way to to measure at the design stage uh, or other stages, retrofit, uh, even operations, um, something that gets at that question in a in a comprehensive way. So you've got various avenues, utility programs, policies, voluntary programs, it's going to be rolled into LEED, the Green Buildings Rating System, uh, as well as, as that pr fully private sector, for example, appraisal. There's, there's several avenues. Oh, I'll add a comment there, if it's okay, Tim, unless you've yeah. got another question queued up. Go ahead. Good. Um, keeping in mind that our ultimate objective in um, creating a resilient and uh, environmentally sound future is to decarbonize our energy use. Fundamentally, that is critical to the climate change agenda and the need to reduce carbon in, in the area, in, the, in our environment, that 
there's two metrics going on here. One is the, the building energy use and the time of use, and the other is the generation source and its time of delivery. It's as simple as that. And until all four of those things line up to be lowest energy use, cleanest delivery, we're going to have a, a continued carbon problem. So there's a fairly simplistic mentality going on in our country that says we need to PV our way out of this problem. We're just going to put PVs on everything and it'll all be better. So I know that probably the, anyone that would attend this webinar is somewhat in the industry and more astute than that, but I think it's important for all of us to advocate and, and educate about the fact that the timing of the delivery of renewables and the energy use volume and timing of use have to play nice together or we're not going to get to a clean energy future. Right, and the intent of the Grid Optimal Initiative by developing these metrics and, and this framework mm -hmm. is to allow uh, on-site renewables, including rooftop solar, for instance, uh, to scale as broadly as possible by making sure that buildings can really use that energy and can, can adopt as much or can, can integrate as much renewable energy as, and as many of those resources as possible. Well, this is obviously quite a deep topic and that's why we are repeatedly doing webinars with a net zero theme. So you can look forward to future uh, webinars. In fact, our March webinar, Kathy, if you could forward to the uh, announcement slide, I wanna uh, put a plug in for our March webinar where we're gonna have the uh, Net Zero Energy Coalition uh, and Ann Edminster, Great. who's the interim executive director of the uh, Zero Energy Net Zero Energy Coalition, is going to talk about residential net zero. Today was all about commercial net zero, and then the uh, the ZEC is their counterpart for residential. So, looking forward to that on March 26th. We host these events uh, the last Tuesday of the month on a monthly basis. I am looking for speakers and topics, so please, if you're attending and listening in. Please send me your ideas or volunteer yourself, and I'll be happy to get into a dialogue about the topic. We like to cover a broad spectrum of topics related to uh, renewables and net zero. So there's plenty of territory to cover. I wanna thank you so much uh, to everybody who attended and uh, typed in questions. Oh, there was one straggler. Uh, the slides and the recording will be posted. We always post that at CECCO.com, seco.com forward slash solar webinar. That is the landing page for SolarWorks for Illinois. And then also on Continental's YouTube channel. So if you just Google Continental Electrical YouTube, you'll find our channel and all the uh, recordings go there. It'll be up within a week or so from today's date and the slides will be posted shortly. So with that, I want to thank our guest speakers today, Kathy and Alexi. That was wonderful. Really appreciate your time. And um, you can forward to the thank you slide and then you can, people can see our contact information. Please con don't hesitate to reach out to myself, T Montague at CECCO.com or Kathy Higgins at Higgins at newbuildings.org. All right, everybody, we will wrap up now. Thank you so much and we'll see you in March.